Welcome. That's right. Get out of here. Yeah. Well, I'm sure your thing will be good, Stephen. <laughs> Passive aggressive. Just, so, just yeah. so you know, I got that on tape. <laughs> I'm sure you did. Steve. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'd introduce myself, but if you don't know me by now, I've been talking all morning. So, uh, hi, I'm Stephen Gallagher. I'm with Red Hat. I've been uh, working on the uh, on the Fedora Server Edition since it began. Actually, since before it began. Uh, it, was, uh, it has been an interesting ride. So it's now been. What is it? Four years? I think it was. It, 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 was, it was first uh, thrown together as, a, as an idea at uh, the first flock in Charleston, which was. That'd be six years. So that can't be right. Five, <laughs> five years, I guess. So it's in the I guess we'll, we'll, we'll split the difference. We'll call it five years. I think it's a year. Year and a half. Year and a half. So uh, I've been giving one of these at each flock since. Um, most of you uh, have probably been to one in the past, uh, past. What I will do is I'll probably talk for 10 or 15 minutes, and then uh, it will be a discussion, uh, at which point we will probably turn off the recording because it won't, rec won't pick anything up. So I'm going to go over a little bit about uh, what we've done in the last year, and uh, you know, what uh, you know, some of our trials, some of our uh, tribulations, a few successes, uh, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about where we think the Fedora server is going to go in the next year and the year after that. So, uh, first topic. Uh, what I call uh, modularity 1.0. Uh, this was... Uh, we, we started... We were talking about this a bit at the, uh, at the previous flock in uh, Cape Cod, and... The idea at the time was that Fedora server was going to be the prototype for this completely new way of building the distribution. From the ground up, it was going to be just these interchangeable modules that we could swap out in and out as, as we pleased. Um, and you know, we were we made some good headway towards this, but we really, really were boiling the ocean. And not all that long after the last flock, we ended up uh, more or less scrapping the plan. So that uh, and that was. Pretty disheartening. I, I, I can speak for myself, and I suspect for a, a number of the people who were working on it that uh, that was a pretty low point in the uh, in, in, in the in the fall. Uh, there was a, there was a, a lot of people had put in a lot of hours on this, and we thought that this was uh, it turned out to be a dead end. Um, however, uh, we did come up with a backup plan, and we were able to reuse a lot of the same framework that we had been using for modularity 1.0 when we figured out that. Uh, Almost by accident, uh, the, co the technique that we had been using it, it turned out to be possible to just fake it into thinking that the main Fedora repository was one big module and go from there. And hey, what do you know? All of a sudden, modules sit on the top and they're great. We were happy again. Um, and we've been, uh, we've been, uh, we've pretty much been putting all of our effort into this modularity 2.0 thing now. And it's been, a, it's been a, a real labor of love for a number of people, many of whom are in this room, which you guys already know this. Um, but it, it's, it's involved a lot of people and a lot of teams. And uh, I will say this, uh, I, I've been at Red Hat now for over a decade. There are a few times, uh, it, it, I've experienced very few times like this where this many teams and this many people have actually come together to work on a, on a project with the same goal in mind and, and actually idealistic about achieving it. And you know what? We've got something good now. So uh, I'm, just, I'm actually going to applaud you guys for a moment. So. <laughs> that, that, that really didn't work. Um, but it, it wasn't just uh, the modularity team or the base OS team or, or the DNF team or the RelEng team or the infrastructure team or the docs team. It was all of these groups working together, so we, we actually did uh, achieve something uh, really, really nice uh, with Modularity 2.0, and uh, we had our first uh, successful release in Fedora 28, with Fedora 28 Server Edition, uh, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about it when I get to the future slide, but uh, as of Fedora, uh, as of uh, two weeks ago, Rawhide now has Modularity enabled for all users of Fedora. Uh, so that's pretty exciting. Um, in the last year, uh, we've, 
when we started the server edition, one of its key fund fundamentals was we were going to just design these server roles. We were going to do uh, these basically prepackaged best uh, best practices uh, solutions for how you would deploy a, a popular service, and we were going to try to make that the de facto standard for how you do this in Linux. Um, this is still a good idea. This would, it, and uh, Matthew is saying this is still a good idea. Uh, I think that's true. I think that uh, the world around us has moved on such that they have found better other other better ways to do that uh, than Rollkit, uh, which uh, we finally put out of its misery uh, this year. Uh, it did not. Uh, it, it had been. Uh, it was a simple Dbus API for doing uh, deployments. It only ever really supported two server roles. Uh, Free IPA and uh, PostgreSQL. Um, it was mostly limping along, and I hadn't killed it before this because uh, QA was uh, using it because it was really easy to set up a uh, Free IPA or, Q or a Postgres server for their testing. Uh, however, it did not survive the, the, move, uh, the move to Python 3.7, and was sufficiently it was sufficiently complicated that I didn't feel like keeping it on life support any longer. So. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Kitty. Your time is up. So, one of the interesting problems that we have right now is we've actually done almost too good of a job, uh, especially with uh, with modularity. We don't, uh, you know, we, we've got the, we still have some bugs to to work out, and we uh, you know we definitely need to clean up clean up the user experience a little, a little bit. But the technology is sound, and we've proved we've proven that it can work. But um, so we we started uh, uh, in the uh, server sig doing a little bit of a thought experiment. So where does this go in the future? Well, the obvious first, the obvious next step is well, we get this into Apple um, because of course Apple is, as Matthew uh, showed in his, uh, state, his state of Fedora speech, Apple is what two orders of magnitude more popular than Fedora proper, something in that area. Three, okay, three orders of magnitude more. Uh, it hits to the mirror at least. Um, that's pretty sizable, uh, and binary orders of magnitude, not, not decimal ones. Binary <laughs> orders of magnitude, not decimal ones. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's not really. It's not a thousand times more popular. You kernel panicked me. Sorry. All right. Um, so, but, uh, and, and I think, you know, that is the logical next step is that we migrate this to being able to support our enterprise uh, users as well. But that's a bit of a double-edged sword because what we will have effectively done at that point is made the Fedora Server Edition completely uh, redundant as far as, uh, from a user's perspective. Uh, we'll have a, we will have reached a point at which, um, right now we have a very small but dedicated and loyal uh, set of people who actually deploy Fedora as a server. Uh, what we know from, in, well, from ANIC data is that approximately zero of them actually use the server edition. They use the server install media to install a, a sm the smallest set of packages they can find. Um, so, Although, I, my mirror stats they show, show actually it's better than that, right? Like, yeah, because that slide I showed, like, Oh, right. Because the okay. Fedora server has. All right, Matthew is Matthew is correcting me that his mirror stats didn't show that there were people actually hitting the uh, the mirror, uh, the uh, modular repo, which was only enabled by default on the server edition. It did not mean that they didn't they couldn't have manually selected that to play around with it either. Uh, there was a, there was a small blip in the uh, statistics that said somebody was using this. It's more than zero. It's more than zero, but uh, it's asymptotically approaching zero. So we are sort of engineering ourselves out of a job, um, but we're in kind of an odd place because, of course, Fedora, in all practical purposes, every, I think everybody knows that uh, RHEL ultimately comes from Fedora Server. Uh, it's, it, it's a place where we try things out, where we start to stabilize them. Sorry, hot spot, just get down. Um, we try to where we start stabilizing them, where we where we you know we fail fast too. We try we try out new things and we we figure out which ones of those are likely to be 
useful to uh, to an enterprise customer down the road. I don't think I don't think this is surprising anyone. I apologize uh, to Red Hat if I'm not supposed to tell that secret, but uh, I, I don't think anybody doesn't know this. So we have we have value to Red Hat, but we're rapidly uh, we're rapidly getting to a point where it doesn't appear that we have value to users, which makes it difficult to uh, to uh, actually use it as a testing ground and to figure out where they, to figure out what will be in the next enterprise release. So, so where are we here? This is where we are. Um, <laughs> we really. We really don't have a clear vision past modularity of what we are doing next. Um, we talked. We talked in the ser uh, service again, we, and uh, I think it was Adam Williamson that pointed out that most of what uh, ServerSig has accomplished in its life, its server edition has accomplished in its life, has been because somebody got it was somebody was really interested about something and drove it to completion. And that was what happened with early on. That was what happened with Rollkit. It kind of petered out. Later, it was the uh, it was the modularity stuff, and it was you know it was a matter of this is an interesting new thing, and we drive and we drove it through, and now we're approaching that annoying part where you know uh, you have to actually make it stable. But that's you know that that's where the career folks of us uh, step in. But how do we expand the server sick? How do we grow it? How do we get people in excited? What is the next exciting thing that we can get people to work on or that we want to get can get people to come and say, hey, I've got this idea. That I want to work on, um, and right now we don't have a lot of good ideas for that because we've kind of we, we have kind of engineered ourselves into a position where we expect that people will probably start using us less because of the things we've done. Uh, uh, so this is the part of the talk where I point the microphone in your direction and you help me figure out what the hell we're doing next. Uh, the floor recognizes Langdon. <laughs> are we using the mic or do you want to shut off the recording? Uh, yeah, I think we should probably uh, cut the recording at this point because uh, the conversation is just going to be in the room. So the, the big gap that I think a server can still fill is one of the problems that I haven't been able to articulate. Because I know. That was my first arm release where I built the lock, so I, you know, it has special significance. I'll just turn the laptop around. <laughs> exactly. Everybody can just crowd up. Um, How dependent are you on your slides? Can you just read and articulate? I mean, to some extent, yeah, but then you'll miss the funny cat pictures, is the problem. As long as they're on the screen reader. Right. Ooh. All right. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, all right. So, as most of you know, I'm Langdon White. Um, and uh, this is. Stephen Gallagher, and uh, you want to go to the next slide? So I always try to include some pictures of my kids because that way I can embarrass them for a long time. Um, but uh, this is my current running joke of trying to get them all in the same picture at the same time, looking reasonable. Um, and 
I was uh, I joined Red Hat actually as a developer advocate, um, and uh, my joke about it is that uh, they got tired of me complaining about all the problems and pulled me into engineering to try to fix them. Then I got suckered into the um, basically the Fedora Next uh, kind of project and kind of been involved in that for a few years now. So, uh, most of you know me, I'm Stephen Gallagher. That is an actual photo of me doing my job in Fedora. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, first, a little bit of the history of the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, so, I try to, this is kind of the short version of this conversation, which is that, um, you know, we have different life cycles, we have different uh, styles of things, right? That's kind of what the planes are supposed to represent. That, you know, we have, um, you know, some planes that fly fast and some that fly slower, and sometimes you need to be able to hook them up together because, you know, one needs to feed gas to the other. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the Boabob, Boabob? Um, I think that's what it's called, is this, uh, this cliff here kind of represents the idea that, you know, all the stuff in the distro is very tightly integrated, one big, huge vertical stack. Um, and so as a result, it has a, a lot of problems with trying to shift things around because that whole wall would just crumble down. Also, it's easy to fall off. That too. Um, and then uh, another thing I like to point out is that over the last kind of 10 years or so, uh, in particular, uh, software development has really changed a lot. We've really shifted uh, in a lot of ways to the power being with developers rather than the power being with sysadmins. So when the distros started, kind of the concept of the distros, uh, sysadmins were trying to take power back from developers. And by developers, I mean, I could mean vendors or, you know, literally software developers in your IT department. Um, but the distros were trying to uh, you know, simplify the overall problem that they were having by locking down what developers could do. Um, and so over the last, like I said, maybe 10 years, the pendulum kind of has started to swing back the other way and software developers are now taking more control. So we th see things like containers, right, are a great example of developers wanting to put what they want to put in production and forget about the sysadmins in the way. Um, how we do development has also significantly changed, right? Like, you put up a website now, and it's like on top of, what, a million, several million lines of code before you get your little smattering of code on the very, very top. Um, so we have a, a couple of interesting things there. Um, both you have that vertical stack problem, but on the flip side, it means you can tear down your entire architecture and replace <laughs> it in sometimes a matter of a day, sometimes a couple of weeks versus when I started doing software development where you would literally spend six months just building the architecture, right? Before you even got to your real content. Um, then kind of the last thing uh, is, uh, and I still haven't found a better way to, to show this, is that different use cases have different needs. So my little graph up there is kind of talking about mutual funds. And so when you're trying to plan for retirement, where you are, what age you are, <laughs> means you should make different investments, right? So you want to make lower, more conservative uh, investments later in life and riskier investments earlier in life. This is also true. So for the same person, you want to make different financial decisions depending on the position you're in right now. So that's what we have this problem with software as well. And distros don't really tolerate that very well, right? They, there is one use case. I installed a web server. It must be for production. When in fact, when I install a web server, I may be installing it so that I can do development on the web server, like I want to actually make commits to HTTPD, or I might be writing HTML pages, or I might be writing PHP. All those use cases are kind of different, and they require different uh, things to um, kind of be installed or how they're set up, right? This is why developers instantly install Apache and then turn off SE Linux and turn off the firewall, right? Because they don't have the time or the energy to figure out how to make this highly hardened, production-ready system into one that they can just do work with, right? This uh, is tying into our next slide here. Yeah, so basically, those are kind of the problems that we saw when we wanted to go into this, to this solution. So this is how we think of, well, this is how the distribution thinks of its users, right? They're all neat and tidy, right? Uh, you know, it's, and we're kind of running with the joke of, you know, it's the 1995, you know, Fedora Distro, um, and that's, uh, what, what yeah, do you think it was? It was like 20 Yeah, it was 2003. Yeah. But, um, uh, what we've, it, Fedora as a distribution is still trapped in the Red Hat Linux days. It's, uh, it, it comes, it originates at a time when 
a distribution was really your only way of getting open source software. You had to, you started from a, from a distro, you started from a basic install, and then you, uh, you know, well, once Yum came around, you Yum installed everything. Before that, you went through RPM hell. But everything came from a single source. It was, you know, you generally would decide you either trusted or didn't trust that source. And that's how you got your software. And if it wasn't there, your two choices were package it, don't use it. Um, that world, we won. Uh, as, uh, open source won. We, we are the default choice for writing new software throughout the world now. And the distros didn't keep up with that. The distros are still thinking, we're the only way you can get software safely. And we have to test it all together, and it has to be delivered on this schedule. And if you don't miss that schedule, you go, you're, you're out six months. And it envisions a world where this is what your, your user's desk looks like. You know, they are very rigid, they are very cautious, they are very, and no. Um, yeah, and so if we move on to the next slide, uh, this is what it actually looks like, right? <laughs> and, and I would argue this is actually what it's always looked like, right? Um, it's just that we could force them a little bit into the slide before. Um, so, you know, I uh, tried to find some, some fun pictures here. Um, Steven actually had the idea yesterday of, of getting a toddler to go around with a stamper, and that's what you end up with for the Venn diagram of, of your users. Um, and so I tried to make it, but I'm not a very good artist. So, uh, yeah, so this is kind of the idea is that uh, users are actually very, very messy, right? It's about use cases, it's about, uh, you know, what they're trying to accomplish that day, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And when I say users, I, I mean a kind of broad swath, right? I mean developers, I mean maintainers, I mean, you know, whoever is actually your user. And all of those uh, considerations need to be thought about. And that's kind of what we led to uh, modularity. Um, go ahead. Um, and so this is kind of where <coughs> modularity fits. Yeah, no, we didn't really have a whole lot of great pictures for this slide. So uh, what I did was I, I decided to take an example. Um, when we did Fedora 28, uh, one of the examples I used was, uh, I've been maintaining a package called Review Board in Apple for the better part of a decade now. Uh, it lived in Fedora for two years uh, before, uh, before its dependent stack, Django, moved past where it could support. Uh, Start, and that, was, that happened back in Fedora 17 or 18. It's been out of the distribution simply because it could, uh, yeah, it just, it's upstream decided to lock on an old version. They maintained the old, they maintained the old version of Django uh, uh, you know, outside of upstream, but we just couldn't have it in our distro because Fedora is first. Fedora only has the latest one. So when we, came, uh, when we came up with this modularity idea, suddenly I was able to actually package this old but still supported version of Django and then bring my, uh, pet, uh, you know, my pet package back into Fedora, where it's been very popular in Apple, but you know, it's always been kind of an embarrassment to us that we couldn't keep it in the uh, main Fedora repositories. And so that was an, op an opportunity that this gave us. Right, so what we're gonna move on to, so basically, you know, this is kind of the introduction. This is why we did modularity. This is what. Oh, this is kind of the point. Um, and I wouldn't say that modularity necessarily meets all of these goals perfectly, but it's a start, right? And I think the important part is that it's a start at the OS level, right? Instead of things like um, alternatives or um, you know like uh, uh, Python M, Python M. I, I, virtual I, yeah, virtual env. Um, I always mix them up because there's RBM and 87 different ones. So all those different solutions are trying to solve very similar problems, but they're doing it from a particular perspective, right? So the Ruby developer who wants to use multiple versions of Ruby has a particular solution for Ruby, whereas um, somebody who wants to run different versions of Java in production might use the alternatives infrastructure. Right? So they're coming from different perspectives and so making different trade-offs and not actually providing kind of a, a quasi-universal solution um, and one that's integrated into, uh, you know, when I say the OS, I mean package management and kind of all that, um, in a way that is part of the system. And so that's what we're trying to do with modularity is we're trying to make it so that it's at the, at the lowest level and part of the overall system itself. Okay. Well, alternative is not part of the OS? In a sense, so the question is, is uh, alternatives not part of the OS? I would say it's sort of part of the OS. It's an add-on in the sense that it's a new piece that is not part of the things that a normal user uses regularly. So, so if, I, if I might? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, 
when we were when we were designing this, uh, we looked at our potential set of requirements, and uh, alternatives was one of the solutions we had, we had looked at, as well as uh, the software, software collections and containers. And what we realized with uh, feedback from uh, PM, uh, PM talking to customers and us talking to, uh, to users was that people didn't actually care about parallel installability as a general case. There, were, there was a one or two percent that did, uh, but for the most part, people only really cared about having the availability of these alternative versions. And so doing multiple packages with different with alternatives was kind of heavyweight. It required the it required users to uh, make uh, conscious choices the same way they did with SCLs, and they required they required them to change their install scripts and change their deployment scripts to make it to be aware of that and to use it. Whereas uh, the approach we took with, uh, with modularity and just switching the streams allows people to just drop their software in exactly where the upstream expects it to be. Uh, and that just cut out a huge barrier to entry uh, for, uh, for users and, made, and is, much, is why it's a much simpler way of doing things than, for example, software collections. It loses the parallel installability side of things, but we reasoned that that was probably not important enough. And I would also add to that, um, uh, and it doesn't necessarily lose parallel install forever. It's just right, right now in our current state. Uh, the other thing I would add about alternatives too is that it's very sysadmin biased. Um, as a developer, um, it's hard to use the alternatives infrastructure to switch between like language language versions a lot, or especially if you're a polyglot developer and you jump between different versions of different languages. Um, the alternatives infrastructure is very hard. It's a very high barrier to learn because it's a new thing you have to learn. Whereas, like I already know Ruby, right? Uh, so that's also an argument for it. I don't know. It's tough. Go ahead. Is it modularity a new thing I have to learn? Uh, theoretically, almost no. That's the goal, right? Is that modularity, oh sorry, the question was, um, isn't modularity a new thing I have to learn? Um, the idea with modularity as a user is that it's basically transparent. Um, you have to indicate that you want a different version of something, but you, but it, that part is obvious. Um, and so, but you can still just use it exactly the same way you've been using the system this whole time because we have the defaults component. And so in that way, if I want to just get Postgres that is shipped by Fedora, I just say DNF install Postgres. And it's done, there's no, I don't know anything about modularity. Um, so it's I only when you want to get further. I, I think what he was saying though is yes, it is still uh, you know, learning that you have to type DNF module enable this version in the stream is something new you have to learn, but it is essentially a one-liner compared to alternatives where you have to understand how, the, how alternatives interact, especially in the case of Java where you have to actually change a whole bunch of different commands all at the same time and know exactly which ones you have to change. It, this, it, it, at the very least, it narrows it down to a single command that we can document really easily yeah. uh, as opposed to a, a, a just labyrinth of esoterica. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, I would understand uh, uh, your, your major point. Uh, you, uh, I know that in the uh, Fedora, there are several times that you can keep a multiple version of the one package. Because you have uh, the core Fedora repo and the updates. And uh, as I could understand, you invite the backdoor to the infrastructure and keep a multiple version of the same. So the question is uh, don't we already have? alternative version or multiple versions of something um, given that we have multiple repos, right? So there's like so the everything repo and we have the updates. The, the uh, Fedora tries to uh, decrease the uh, cost of the maintenance on the infrastructure by keeping only or providing the, the latest uh, packages and uh, pay this And as, as I could understand, uh, you, you provide a new approach how to, how to let's say, uh, overrun this restriction, provide a multiple version of the same functionality. Right, so, the, okay, so the, the I, I guess I'm, I'm not sure what the question is, though. Uh, are you just saying, are you correct? Yeah. Okay, so. Um, so am I correct if I could understand yeah, yeah. the point, yeah? So, um, so the comment is basically, um, 
what we have today is that we have, say, the everything repo and the updates uh, on top of that, and basically we keep at most dish two versions of any given thing, you know, kind of the one that was shipped and then whatever the current update is. Um, Excluding tricks, uh, tricks and hacks, like, name, like specialized naming. Right, so yeah. we already do hack around that. Um, so, and that's actually a little bit of the point, and that with modularity, um, we would potentially massively increase the number of copies of any given thing that we might have in the repo side. And that is definitely a possibility. However, I would argue a couple things. One, we do that already to some extent, maybe not to this extent, by using name mangling, uh, rather than actually using the metadata that we have and could provide. Um, so I think it's kind of ugly the way we do it now. Um, and the other thing is that I think people forget how much policy we have in place around RPM. We could do all kinds of that stuff right now today by just standing up new repos or whatever, but we have policies in place that says, you know what, we're only gonna have two copies of any given thing. It's not because we technically can't. Um, so with modularity, we have the same problem. We just haven't built up 10 years of knowledge of what those policies should be. So we do need policy that says, hey, we need to limit the number of you know, versions of things that are out there because we can't maintain a distro that, uh, you know, where everything under the sun is available. I'm going to contradict you there. Sure. Um, and say that ultimately the decision on, uh, I, I think the decision on how many versions, how many streams of something that you want to use in modularity should really be up to whoever is going to maintain it, not up to the distro as a whole saying, no, you can only have two or three of them. I think it's, if you're upstream, you know, if you have a very easy upstream that just happens to release, you know, the very old stable, the old stable and the uh, new, uh, and the new shiny re uh, releases on a regular basis, if you want to maintain those three, maintain those three. It's, it, it's going to be up to the maintainer to decide which, wh when they want to carry more than one stream and how much maintenance they want to do on it. As long as somebody is willing to step up and do the work, modularity will let them step up and do that work. I mean, if we need to, you know, I'll kick in the hundred bucks, we need to go buy another terabyte drive, right? I mean, space is cheap, right? So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really matter that much from a disk perspective. It does matter from a network perspective, potentially. But, the, and we might have policy around um, the actual, uh, like, core components, right? This is where we get into things like rings, ideas, and stuff like that. Um, all right, we're going to have to move on with the talk soon, but I'm going to go to him, and then I'll go to you. Um, yeah, I just have a small point. So Pedram is not going uh, or is not distributing packages. We have a partner that are allowed to distribute the Fedora content. Therefore, the if this problem is yeah. large, okay, uh, it will not cost uh, Fedora project anything. Yeah, I was mostly but joking. But the partners will give it up the, uh, the distribution, for example. So the concern is that the mirrors may not want to distribute a much larger amount of content. We have actually already run into that. Um, it is definitely a concern. So we have to we have to consider that problem. That's part of our policy problem, right? Uh, personally, what I would actually recommend is that uh, why don't we make mirroring significantly easier so I could run a mirror out of my house. Um, Oh. And because right now it's it's relatively difficult, I would I would say actually let's try to increase our number of mirrors rather than uh, worry too much about the amount of content we're pushing through them. Uh, but to be fair, just, uh, uh, this is a problem that Fedora is facing anyway. before modularity. Uh, yeah, we but already I mean, have mirrors that are uncomfortable with the amount of content that Fedora carries simply because we just carry so damn much. Yes, and it's increasing at an exponential rate. Right. And having dealt with the mirror people before, there was a an agreement right. about the yeah. amount of space that we're allowed to use, bandwidth, et cetera, et cetera, and we're well and truly over that semi-pseudo agreed limit. Right. Um, and we have huge amounts of problems getting mirrors as it is. Um, okay. And there are certain areas in the world, um, South America, Australia, um, like if you're on certain networks in Australia, you basically have to go to the US and back to right. get access to the data because okay. all Let me the, pause there. So, yeah. um, so basically, the, there is definitely concern about mirrors. It actually existed prior to modularity anyway. Yeah. Um, but you know, modularity potentially can make it worse. And I definitely agree. But again, I would reiterate, it's like we've got to remember that we've spent whatever 10 years plus um, you know, standing up policy around the way we do things today. Because we have a new, more flexible way of doing things doesn't mean we don't need policy around how we do them uh, that makes it sane. 
All right, I'd, I'd like to make one last comment on this and then move on because it's kind of outside the scope of this talk. But uh, one, there is actually one place that modularity can make this less of an issue. And uh, that is that in the Fedora project, uh, because of the way that RPMs have worked in the past, you've always had to package all of your dependencies first and then get those into Fedora. And those fill up the, uh, the, repository, uh, the repositories and those also fill up um, you know, your maintenance time because now you're maintaining some, other pa some package that some other pack uh, packages are depending on. Modularity allows you the ability to, to build your build depths and use them just for your package and then not ship that, those build depths. So if we, if we move a lot more people to modularity, I suspect we will discover that there's an awful lot of software in Fedora that exists solely to support the build of some other package, and we can probably trim down the mirrors in some, to some degree by doing that. So Adam, did you have something else? No, that was my question. Okay. Uh, Eduardo? Uh, yeah, I'm maybe we should pull questions from that. Slide and then maybe there is a, a policy about how many maintainers can have a module. Because, for example, if a module, uh, if the maintainer wants to keep versions 3, 4, and 5, writing three strings, but I need version 2, can I be willing to maintain just this version 2, even when they, uh, the proper maintainer has so, three other strings? So the question is essentially, um, you know, what is the policy around who owns the, which streams are available for any given module? And I would say, come to the modularity working group and let's make sure we set a policy for that. So there's a lot of policy that's open right now. And, you know, to some extent, this is where we need the community to get involved and, and start to help us feel out what the right policies are. I also think I that we're going to have the wrong policies at first, and we will fix them over time. I assume that the way we would handle that policy is the same way we do in Fedora and Apple. Uh, there are plenty of people who maintain a package just for Apple because the Fedora maintainer doesn't want to support an old OS. You know, I, I assume we will just simply allow them to have access to that branch right. if they're willing to do it. But I reiterate the statement. Come help us define the policy. All right. So All right. So let's on. talk about the reasons why you might modularize. Yeah. All right. So kind of the point of this talk is really like, when does a module make sense for you, especially given the architecture that we ended up with um, for F28, right? That's what we're on? Yeah. Um, F29. So the current architecture um, kind of uh, uh, makes it so that you, you kind of add on the modules uh, when you need them. So what we want to do was a talk about when might you need them. And so the first example, which I think most people um, kind of know about already, uh, is this one where you want to have two versions of something. Um, and so we have, you know, baby dolls, which I thought was entertaining, um, and goats, those goats, maybe, sheep, I don't know, animal. Um, so we have multiple versions of something maintained upstream. Um, you know, the Django is a great example, right, is that they, they are supporting at least two, probably, um, versions, you know, as do most of those kinds of frameworks. They're usually two in flight. I usually, um, I usually use Node.js as the perfect example here because they maintain two LTS versions and a, and a uh, development version at any given time. Right, right. So Node.js has even three, um, but like most frameworks have at least two. Um, you know, Drupal actually I've been fighting with lately. Um, they're currently maintaining uh, three versions, I think six, seven, and eight. Um, and all of them are not easy to port across. Uh, so that's why they end up maintaining them for so long is because you, it's very, very difficult to move versions. Um, so this is one of the big examples. Basically, what we're trying to do here is we're trying, like, it's good that the newest version of something is available in Fedora. What's bad is that if it's something like a framework, it means that the newest version of something else is not available in Fedora because they haven't had time to port to the newest version. Right, so what we're trying to do is give them lifecycle flexibility when, um, you know, when they're ready to do their upgrade, uh, you know, they can kind of, they can keep maintaining their application in the current version until they're ready to do that work. So that's that one. Um, you want to move on to the next one? Yeah, and, and similarly, in keeping with Fedora's, uh, you know, first identity, uh, it also allows us, like I said, with Node.js, the example is uh, we can carry both LTS versions and make one of those, you know, make the newest one of those the default. But then we can also carry their development one. So people who want, so we can encourage people who want to do new Node.js development to use Fedora as well, and not be required to go off to Node Source or one of those other places that uh, has a really hacked up uh, Fedora implementation that doesn't work very well. Right. I mean, a lot of this, you know, a, a good example for this was with Python, right? Is that you know didn't want to switch Fedora to Python three for a long time because of how much Python two stuff would break, right? Um, 
If you're using modularity, you don't have to have that pain. We can continue to make Python 2 the default, but make Python 3 available. Um, but we have that without modularity. Sort of. So, bad, the, bad, uh, so the example Python here is so, a terrible example, and uh, let's. I I'm definitely gonna, I'm gonna stop you with this one because that one, <laughs> that one, that one has, is a minefield, and we're going to end up in a, in a debate rather than a, a talk. Yeah. So okay. So the comment is basically that Python can can do parallel installability on its own. I, I definitely disagree that it's the same, but whatever. Um, let's move on. Um, all right, so the next one is when the upstream releases don't align. We've kind of alluded to this example already, um, but the, you know, Fedora comes out on a theoretical, you know, six month cadence. Um, what happens when something comes out in month seven? Uh, well, that means you have to wait a whole nother cycle before you can get it, right? Um, with the modularity, we can release them whenever we want, right, in theory, uh, depending on what it is and how it works. But for the most part, that's the idea, is that we can ship whatever version comes out when it's ready, um, and we can ship it for whatever currently supported versions of Fedora are available. Uh, we can actually do it for more than that, except going back to policy, we don't want to, right? Um, so that's kind of what this is talking about, is how do we make it so that um, you know, software can land when we want it to. Um, and then on the flip side of that, we have the older software, right? So things like databases, for example, have a typically a, like a five-year life cycle. Do you really need to upgrade your database every time a new version of the OS comes out? Most people find that actually incredibly risky, right? So they stick with a version of the database for a long time. Um, so what this lets us do is let you to maintain your existing you know, whatever, MariaDB 10 um, across multiple versions of Fedora without forcing you to upgrade your database um, until you're ready to make that choice. Um, considering that the database itself doesn't require an update. All right, and so the last one, um, uh, okay, this, I have no recollection. Um, so this, oh. is, this is similar to the previous yep. one. It's. Um, the, the, the case we usually use as an example here would be uh, hypothetically free IPA. Um, traditionally, free IPA and the, and, the, and the OS release have been very tightly re related and similar to the database case, uh, when you go to upgrade Fedora 28 to Fedora 29, you're not just saying, okay, so I'm going to get a newer kernel, a newer GLib, uh, C, some newer, uh, some newer bash, uh, you know, system level tools and a, and a new GDM or a new, a new GNOME setup. What you're saying is everything on my system is is upgrading, including these applications that I rely on. So I am not I am not going to move anything until I can test uh, that the entire stack that I rely on my in my infrastructure works, and that's unreasonable. reasonable. It's one of the main reasons why people don't like to deploy Fedora in production, is that you can't update the OS and the applications on their own on their own separate life cycles. And so modularity gives us the ability to say, hey, this critical app that you're relying on. You can lock that here, and on an upgrade or an update, you uh, you know even between Fedora 28 and Fedora 30, as long as you know as long as Fedora 30 is still capable of supporting that that application, you just update the OS underneath, and your and the bits on the uh, of the module providing the application will stay the same. So it allows you to update your uh, your OS, which may mean that you get a you know low level kernel uh, security updates and other, and all sorts of new, uh, new uh, performance enhancements. But your actual the, the thing you care about is your application, and then we, we've hammered this home. Is that nobody really cares what OS you're running as long as your application keeps going. This is a way to do that, and allow us to keep our fast uh, OS schedule without uh, without. Uh, it, it is hopefully a way to get us from the set of users that are that always update two uh, two releases at a time, because they uh, because they just push or they they push off this pain. For one, for a whole year instead of every six months, and it allows us to get to a point where Fedora 28 to 29 and 29 to 30, those are more like service packs than they are upgrades. Yeah, you also have this this case in the application developer uh, scenario in kind of the reverse, where you want the bleeding edge of you know Node.js um, because you know you're going to be deploying in three to six months, and you know that version will be stable by then. So you want to go get you want to do all your development on the dev version of Node.js, so the idea is that, okay, but you still want to be able to upgrade your, your operating system itself on your laptop or on your workstation or whatever, so to provide, be able to provide some independence there means that you don't turn off updates for six months while you're doing development. 
um, which I know I have done before, um, particularly on Windows, um, because I know that there's a potential that when those updates may impact my code. And I want to scope the time period where I'm fighting through that fire to one period of time. So you turn off updates for X amount of time, and then all at once, you turn on updates, you take all the updates, and then you go through your whole test, CI, whatever cycle, and go and just deal with bugs from the upgrade. So it, it's also the reverse case where you want the bleeding edge stuff, but you want to still be able to take regular updates. All right, so one of the other things I want to make the point of, and also a teaser for my next stuff. Uh, before this, this uh, I, I had meant to insert a slide here, and I, did, I, I forgot to. So uh, before this, uh, I wanted to uh, cover a couple of the cases where modularity is not a good fit. Okay. Um, and so, for example, I do not foresee a world in which we modularize glibc. Uh, I don't see I don't see a world where extremely common uh, low-level libraries are, are anything but part of the OS itself. Uh, these, if you've got uh, you know if you've got glibc or you have, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Peter. Um, doesn't some of the problems where you're saying I want to keep one as version X, like, and then upgrade a different one, isn't some of that just fixed by running them all in separate containers? So the question is basically, um, if you want to have lifecycle independence between different components of your OS, say, or, app, or distro, um, couldn't you just use containers for that? Um, and the answer is sometimes. Um, in fact, right, if you look at data centers before containers, most people run a VM per application. Now they're making that cheaper by doing it with containers, but they're doing the same thing. Per application. Or, and yeah. in the case of like your IPA example, like one of the flaws in that is IPA doesn't support running alongside other applications on the same machine. So the problem is also though that you have, um, you have other stuff besides IPA in your container. And you may want to also upgrade that stuff. State the question. Uh, oh, sorry. So the ex example is uh, well, going back to the container example, or a VM example, or a physical server example. Even if you're dedicating basically the the user space to one given application, um, does that solve this problem in and of itself? And the answer I would say is sometimes, but that I think you're glossing over uh, the other updates that are that need to take place inside that user space um, that modularity can still help with. Um, and the other side of things too is uh, the content that goes into your containers. Um, there are times when you want that container's user space to be the latest and greatest because you've got the latest, new heart bleed or the new uh, or, or you know whatever whatever new named uh, vulnerability we've got. And but you still want to have that same exact application. You don't want you know you don't want to have to be required to pull down some new upstream version because they built it on top of the other one. So constructing those containers, uh, modularity gives you, it gives you that control as well. Right. So. Okay, so the example of kind of when modularity is a bad idea, um, you know, is low level, heavily shared system components are probably not a great fit, um, which is what we kind of discovered when we were trying to build the base OS or platform um, modules is that the maintenance and effort around that is as much as doing the whole distro. Um, and having multiple versions available of any of those individual components is not very useful. Um, so that's probably when you should shy away from it. If it's something that's heavily reused by uh, you know, kind of everyone else, a traditional RPM probably makes more sense. Um, the flip side of that is maybe we'll get there someday Right? Maybe we will see uh, a way to, to start to simplify those components so that we can do more shared components in this way. Um, but that day is not today, uh, and it's probably not for several years. So we need to, it's like a lot of new things. When we have new capabilities, we, we should feel out how they work before making long-standing uh, hard decisions about it. What modularity is trying to do is offer flexibility in our decision making. It is not trying to say that everything should be a module, right? It's trying to say um, sometimes it makes sense and sometimes it doesn't. Um, and we want to have the, the build infrastructure of flexibility that we can make those choices based on the software itself rather than based on what our build infrastructure can build. All right, now we go to the next slide. Um, so 
what I wanted to talk about here was just that there are other distros that are also doing this. Um, and, you know, and so here are basically some quick examples. Um, Amazon Linux 2 Extras is what it's actually called. Um, uh, it starts to do something kind of like modularity where it, um, they offer alternate versions of things in separate repos that you can uh, install. Um, and if you want to know more about it, I will talk about it more later. Uh, SUSE modules, SUSE is now offering in their enterprise editions, um, or at least they were last time I looked, um, in their enterprise editions, uh, alternate repos with different versions of software. They're doing more like, um, it's more like RHEL's extras. Uh, so you, they have, I think one's called like web development. And so they have a bunch of new versions of say PHP in there, but they're kind of mixed together into one repo. So you enable that repo and you have options on a new version of PHP and a new version of Nginx. You know, but then they have a couple of, they have like five or seven different version, uh, repos of various subjects. Um, Gwix and NixOS um, is actually modularity if we could burn everything down and do it right. Um, it's really interesting. Um, from a user perspective, it's very different, right? Uh, so like if we were totally fine with just, you know, everyone forgetting about this whole YUM and DNF thing altogether and just do things completely differently from the get-go, um, Nix does a really interesting job of this. I would actually, going back to Peter's point, um, that a lot of the oh. advantage that they give is actually solved in containers. Um, so, you know, the parallel installability and stuff that they're capable of is, while really interesting, may not be that necessary, uh, especially not necessary enough to burn everything to the ground. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, <coughs> I was going to comment, I have an example um, from the past that containers were not of salt, is uh, when Rails 4 came into Fedora, um, the version of Fedora with, Rail, uh, with Rails 3 end of life before Rails 3 did, mm -hmm. Um, and there was literally no way if you had not done the non-trivial task of porting to Rails 4, like what do you do? Yeah, so the example basically is um, when Rails 4 came out, it basically missed the Fedora release schedule window correctly. You know, it, like it wasn't timed perfectly with Fedora, so it was incredibly difficult to get from Rails 3 apps to Rails 4 apps. No, no, no. Oh, sorry. Rail, so Rails 4 went into Fedora. So let's yeah. say, I don't remember what it was, let's say Fedora 15 came out with Rails 4, and then Fedora 16 came out and still had Rails 4, but Rails 4 completely replaced Rails 3 in the distro. Right. But we had an app in, in the team I was on written in Rails 3, um, and it was very non-trivial to port to Rails 4. Right. But by the time we were able to port to Rails 4, the version of Fedora with Rails 3 was end of life. Right. So we, we could have stuck in a container, but then the entire container runtime doesn't get security updates. Right. So, okay, so the example, I guess I just kind of stated it wrong. I understood your point. I just spoke it poorly. It doesn't um, matter. I just was <coughs> right. commenting. So basically, this, this is one of those cases that modularity would make easier. Yes. Right. Repeat. So, so yeah, so basically the, the example was that um, Rails 3 uh, was in version X of Fedora. Um, Rails 4 came out in version Y. The upgrade from Rails 3 to Rails 4 was non-trivial. So most large applications that were using Rails 3 were stuck. Um, and many of them stuck long enough that the version of Fedora that still had Rails 3 end of life before they actually got to do the upgrade. Um, and this is my exact example with like Drupal was the same problem. Uh, I actually remember when Drupal um, had not upgraded to PHP, I want to say 5.3, and all the distros adopted it. So there wasn't even a distro you could choose that you could run Drupal on. You had to back pin, right? You had to pin it to older versions. Um, and it took, it took Drupal like six months or a year um, to upgrade, which is not cool. So, uh, not on the Drupal guys. Not cool for anybody trying to run that in production. All right, so finally, moving on. Now what? Um, so this is kind of explaining uh, modularity uh, in kind of the new architecture, uh, which is basically that there's um, kind of a, a set of RPMs, or we have been jokingly referred to as bear RPMs, which of course sounds like the um, bear, like the animal. So then we end up with like ursine RPMs and we end up with um, what medved, I don't know how to say that, medved um, RPMs, etc. So any word that you can think of for bear, then RPM is also entertaining for us. Um, and then you have the modules kind of sitting on top of it. Um, so, you know, 
the names are a little arbitrary, but you know, kind of imagine the application streams up on the top, right? And then the kind of the base or you know what is essentially the everything repo today. I'm glad you're covering my very important calc use case. Thank yes, you. yes. Uh, <laughs> the calc use case is a major driver of all of modularity because there's <laughs> apparently both a uh, stable and devel version of the calc application. Because you know, yeah, just use base site. That happens to be a calculator. <laughs> yeah. All right. So moving on, um, and which we are at Q and A, which is good. <clears throat> we are at two minutes. Oh, good. Excellent. So we timed it well. We we planned the tech problems. Um, <laughs> all right. So do we have any more general questions? Um, we weren't sure if we wanted to show up like actual examples or whatever. Uh, Eduardo actually had his hand up fastest. Well, I want to use the password. Oh, but Brendan's. Well, he wants Brendan to go first. <laughs> Do you have specific policy that you're advocating for now that we have this technology in Fedora? Uh, so the question is, uh, do we have specific policies that we would advocate for um, in Fedora to make to keep this same? Uh, well, my first policy would be back the CI objective uh, because that widens our abilities by a lot, right? The second we have good solid CI in the infrastructure, a lot of our concerns about the number of different streams of things that we have are at least lessened if not go away, right? Uh, so that's a huge thing I think is really, really important to the modularity project. I thought so from the get-go. Um, so that's the first thing. The next thing is I think we should also, we should start small, right? In the sense that, um, you know, two streams of something is probably the limit. Um, at least, it, well, sorry, and when I say two streams, I mean there's maybe something in the, oh, can we go back to the architecture side? Um, you know, there's, there's a version of it in the base, right? And then there's, a, there's one other version, right? So, so two so versions. is not doing that. Right. right. So <laughs> now we might have a few exceptions, but for the most part, we probably want to try to limit it to two-ish until we really start to feel how much work it actually is. Um, so those would be some things. Um, Let's see, what else? Uh, I don't know, that's the biggest one I've got. I don't know. Do you have a yeah, I, again, I'm going, to, I'm going to disagree with you that I think the policy, <laughs> I think the, uh, the policy would, it, it, I, I wouldn't set this as a formal policy. I would just say that anyone who is doing the, uh, who, want, who is willing to do the work is allowed to do the work. If they, if they find that it's too much effort, then they drop a stream in the next release. Right, right. What's uh, your experience been, Stephen, with doing <laughs> Node.js in multiple versions like this? My How experience? Like, what uh, the multiple look like versus the stream? Honestly, I have found it with Node.js specifically that it has sorry, not... Sorry, my question. Please. Sorry, the question was how was my personal experience? Uh, I know I'm getting flagged for time, so uh, this will be our last answer, sorry. My experience has been that uh, it has been minimal, minimal additional effort over maintaining Node.js to begin with, although uh, we are talking about a, you know, for, uh, you know, 1 being a very large chunk. But uh, it, 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 it's a little bit of additional work, but also the uh, module stream expansion stuff, which we'll talk about later in my talk with Mohan, uh, has, it makes it a lot easier for me to get it running on 28 and 29 at the same time as well. So. It, they're, they're, it, it pretty much balances out. I haven't actually found it to be more work than the pack, than regular package maintenance. All right, so I think we are at time. Um, so thanks for coming. Yeah.